Well, I'm absolutely delighted to uh, introduce to you um, Conrad Wolfram. He's a physicist, he's a mathematician, uh, he's a technologist, and he's a genius. Uh, but he's also a boat rocker. Uh, he is somebody who um, is extremely provocative in trying to persuade us to completely rethink the way we approach life, not least in mathematics. Conrad. Thanks very much, John. Uh, a, a very kind introduction. It's good to be here. There is little question that maths education around the world has a problem. If you talk to most governments, they think that their maths is failing in their country. If you talk to students, they think it's difficult and many feel disenfranchised. If you talk to teachers, they find it a huge struggle to move the mathematics of their students forward. And yet the people who want mathematics in the outside world, the, the employers and people in their everyday lives, find they don't have enough mathematics. It's extraordinary that mathematics is a subject that is so uh, dispiriting to so many people in education, and yet in the outside world, it is more important than it ever has been in human history. The world is a far more quantitative place. We rely on mathematics, our economies are driven by it to a far greater extent than ever before. So the question is, why do we have this chasm between the two maths, the maths in education and the maths outside? What's the problem and how can we fix it? Well, I think the answer is staring us right in the face. Computers. Computers are the big dividing factor between education in the real world and education outside. See, in the real world, maths is all about problem solving, modeling, simulation, thinking out what the questions are, analyzing the results, critiquing them. But in education, it looks very different. It's doing calculations, mostly by hand, if you're lucky with a calculator. The problems are small and seem very distant from the real world. So to explain more about what I mean and what we should do, let me start by asking the question, why are we learning maths? In particular, why should everyone in the world learn maths? Well, I think there are three reasons you can really come up with. The first is technical jobs. Technical jobs drive economies more than anything else. Virtually every study has shown that the ability at doing maths and therefore STEM drives economic progress and the individual's economic uh, capabilities. So it's very important for our economies that, uh, that people learn maths. The second one is just everyday living. To survive in any economy, and particularly in developed ones, you need to be far more quantitative than ever before. Whether it's dealing with mortgages or uh, deciding whether to believe government statistics, it's pretty important to know whether uh, to have some way of feeling mathematics, to feel whether you can uh, trust the answer, be able to set up and understand problems. The third thing is what might be described as logical mind training. Mathematics has been the most incredible human endeavor at understanding how to reason. And whether you're using it for mathematics itself or in other walks of life, be it business or, or just thinking about the world, it's an incredibly powerful logical system. But the current mathematics we have isn't really achieving any of these. Let's turn to another question. What is mathematics? What do we mean when we say we're doing it or we're learning it? Well, I think there are about four steps to mathematics. In a sense, it's a process. The first step is posing the right question. You know, if you ask the wrong question about a situation, you're almost always going to get uh, the wrong answer. So you need to ask the right question about your situation, and then you need to turn that from the real world into a maths formulation. Put it into a specific math setup so that you can do step three, calculate it. Calculating means taking it from your setup to the answer in a mathematical form. And then step four is taking that mathematical answer and turning it back into the real world and crucially verifying it. Here's the crazy thing. Around the world, we're taking about 80% of students' time in schools doing step three by hand. And yet that's the one step that computers can do better than any human. We should be using computers to do step three, except in a few edge cases where it is still useful to do mental arithmetic and things. 
and we should be using students to do far more of steps one, two, and four. We don't want students to be third-rate computers. We want them to be first-rate problem solvers. See, the key point to understand is math is not equal to calculating. It's a much bigger subject. It's the thing that you would like to you know, avoid if you can. It's a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. So the better we can automate and empower the calculation, the better we can problem solve, the higher level the problems can be. And this is a big problem. So my estimation is every year we spend 21,000 average world lifetimes teach, uh, for students learning how to hand calculate. That is a massive human endeavor, a problem of 21,000 lifetimes each year. And I ask this question, when people say, shouldn't, shouldn't everyone learn this because it's part of our culture? Well, I ask the question and compare it to ancient Greek. In Europe, some people learn ancient Greek as a subject in school, but it's a very specialized subject. I learned a bit of ancient Greek. I quite enjoyed it, but it was a specific specialized subject. I don't think we should be teaching ancient Greek to the world's population for 10 years of their lives. I do think there's a mathematics that we should be teaching them that's the, the kind that I'm describing. So we've got to distinguish that and realize this is a major human endeavor that we've got to have a very, very good reason for doing. Now, I want to make clear, a distinguish, uh, to distinguish clearly between two ways in which technology is being used or should be used for mathematics. What I'm talking about primarily here is computer-based. It's taking the real-world subject that has changed beyond recognition in the last decades because computers liberated mathematics from their calculating and taking that and just applying it in education. The subject of mathematics changed in the outside world because computers did the calculating. It now needs to change in education as well to mimic the real world. That's computer-based. But it's also computer-assisted. Much of what's been talked about this morning and in the rest of this conference, applying computers to improve the process of learning. That's also important. But we mustn't confuse the two. In fact, we need computer assisted to help the process of learning computer-based maths. But computer assistance by itself isn't enough. Deploying the wrong subject very well isn't going to make it the right subject. So how do people object to the position I'm taking on mathematics? What do they say? Well, one of the things they say is you need to get the basics first. I think what they mean by this is you have to work stuff out on paper before you do it on a computer. But you've really got to ask, basics of what exactly? You know, are the basics of driving a car learning how to service it or engineer it for that matter? Are the basics of photography today loading a film into your camera or coating a plate with chemicals? I don't think so. I think those are the machinery of the moment. The basics of mathematics, in my view, are those four steps of problem solving. And we should be careful to make sure that we focus on what we're trying to achieve, not the mechanics that, that allows us to achieve it at that moment. Let me say one other thing about basics, that sometimes the order of invention of the technology affects how people think is the more basic part of it. So an example I often love to give, my daughter, when she was about four, used to make paper laptops. She would fold a piece of paper in half, draw a screen on the top, and keys on the bottom. And I said to her one day, you know, when I was your age, I didn't make a paper laptop. Why do you think that was? She thought very carefully for a couple of seconds and, and then said, no paper? <laughs> Just because paper was invented before computers, it doesn't mean it gets you more to the basics of the subject. Now, one of the things that's gone wrong in our curricula, which I think is connected to this question, is how they're labeled, how we think about the curriculum. And typical maths curricula have things in them like completing a square, inverting matrices. This is to do with the mechanics of the calculating, solving simultaneous equations, what I call mechanic-centric. What we should be doing is problem-centric mathematics. And I put a few examples up here, but they're very culturally uh, different and you know, they should be problems that the kids involved, or the adults for that matter, are keen to solve at their point, that they find interesting. Design a currency, what coins and notes do you need? 
good one for, for this city. Given the traffic, when should I leave for work or for school? If I leave a little bit early, I'll get there much too early, but if I leave a little bit late, I might get there much too late. It's a complicated thing to model. How many levels of friends am I separated by on Facebook? Even things like, what is a beautiful shape? You see, and the great thing with a computer is once you have a computer, you can answer questions like, how much should you compress a photo to fit on your computer? And you can actually see the result of this. As I pull this, you can start understanding the mathematics of compression. And you see on the right here that this is a compressed image. You can try different versions of this compression to see what happens. So you can actually use the computer to experience some of the things that you're interested in. Let me move on to a second objection. Computers dumb maths down. What I tell people to do is look in the real world. Do you honestly believe that computers have somehow reduced the conceptual mathematical empowerment that's required for biology or physics or engineering or music or any of the things that rely on mathematics? It's really hard to argue that they have, quite the opposite. These are far more complex problem-solving, uh, mathematically problem-solving subjects than they ever were in the past. Now, of course, you can completely, and, and so the same should be true for education too. If you use computers correctly to do the calculation, you can do much harder problems, you can go further, you can get people more experience. That's the crucial thing. They need to experience maths and gain experience of doing it. Now, of course, you can use computers wrongly. You can have everything turn into a multiple choice question so it's easy to mark. You can do what somebody was proud to show me, which was their, their computer system, which helps you learn how to solve a quadratic equation by hand. The computer is acting as the teacher to help to learn something that the computer should be doing. Completely backwards, in my view. Let's get the computer solving the equation and the fig student figuring out why they want to solve it and what the problem is. And, of course, when you do things on computer, this is a simple example you might have in school today. X plus two, uh, it's a sort of sim simultaneous equation. I won't read it out. But you see, when you've got a computer, you can do harder calculations in it. Here's a cubic version of the same equation. Same principle, same kind of problem, same equation, but you can now do a much more real life example. Third objection, hand calculating procedures teach understanding. You know, I have to say most people by now do rote learning of procedures in their maths education and they apply them and they don't really know why they're applying them or what they might result in. So I really don't think that's happening at the moment. I do believe that procedurizing things is an important aspect of life. But there's a way that we do procedurizing and we write it down. They're called programs and the process is called programming. And I think programming to maths is quite a similar relationship to composition to, I would normally say English, but your own language, whether it's English or Arabic. It's the same kind of connection. Programming allows you to write down your understanding of the subject. And of course, the great advantage is you can then run the program and actually do things with it. So programming is a crucial part of early maths education. It should be part of primary maths education uh, just as a way to express oneself. So I'm arguing for a mathematics that is both more practical and more conceptual. The thing which is exciting at the moment is we don't have to choose. The mathematics of the real world is far more intellectual and conceptual than the mathematics we're teaching right now. By mimicking the real world, we will improve both practical use and conceptual understanding. And it doesn't matter what area we're doing. There are many things you can do straight off uh, and um, uh, um, hopefully this video will run here, but uh, if not, doesn't matter. Uh, and you can show various different kinds of things that you might, uh, might experience in the real world. Now, one thing that doing computer-based maths allows us to achieve is reordering the curriculum. Right now, the curriculum's ordered by computational complexity, how hard it is to calculate things. But it shouldn't be. It should be ordered by conceptual complexity. How hard is it to understand things? The computer can do the calculating. Take calculus as an example. We usually teach calculus to children very late, maybe they're 15 or 16. But actually, you can get a very early impression of calculus, like this example, where we're increasing the number of sides of a polygon. 
and we were going on increasing them until it's a very large number of sides. And then it looks a bit like a circle. And that's an exciting idea, that if you make the sides really, really small, you can calculate things based on the idea that you have an infinitely small side. You have an infinite number of sides and an infinitely small, uh, small slice. Differential calculus, there's the beginning of it. That's a fundamental idea of how we calculate things in the world, how we work things out, which is extremely useful and empowering. But most five-year-olds could start to see the beginning of that. Take primary school, take thermodynamics. You know, as I start to uh, change the number of atoms or increase the temperature or change the, the uh, container size, I can see how it affects the pressure. It gives me a feel for what's going on. I'm not lost in the calculations. I'm experiencing what maths can do for me. Now, one big barrier in many parts of the world is assessment. And the question I was going to ask actually yesterday was, is assessment improving or making worse uh, our education around the world? It depends. But I think in mathematics in particular, if we make everyone do assessment of hand calculating and not problem solving, we're going to tie down what's possible with this new era of computer-based maths. So we need to fix assessment around the world. I want to come on to why now? People have been talking about reforming maths for many years. Why are we thinking particularly about it at this point? Well, I think there are a number of reasons, but let me summarize them this way. The impetus is overwhelming. The chasm between real life maths and maths in education is growing every year as we don't fix this problem. And I think governments and others who are empowered around this understand that in almost every, every part of the world. I've talked about ubiquity. It's not there yet. In the developed world, we are close to having ubiquity of computing devices. You know, you have your, your phone or your computer with you almost all the time. Clearly, in the developing world, that isn't the case yet. Although I think on the time frame of this major world reform, uh, we will see close to ubiquity in many places of some kind of computing device. And the other thing is interface. A lot of the efforts in computer engineering recently have been into improving the way in which we interface with the computer as, as well as the base power. I want to show you two examples of that and talk through a little bit of the technology that is now um, available. So first, I'll mention computable documents. So this is an example of a research paper written by an economist, and it looks just like any old research paper, except in the middle of it, you can actually do things. The data and the information are all here, and you can play with it. You can experience the economics in different ways. Now, when I talked about assessment, one of the kinds of assessments we should be doing is getting students to go in beyond the level of mathematics they could synthesize and comprehend more complicated cases. That's a very important part. If you're shown this economics paper, what can you understand about it? If you read it, what can you analyze? What do you understand? What do you not believe about it? So the fact that we can interact with documents and things and make textbooks like this is very important. Let me show you another example. And uh, try to stop, stop using the internet for a, few, for a few minutes while I show this. And uh, with any luck, uh, we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get enough bandwidth. You know, I can talk to my computer, and I can get it to do things in maths now. So let me try that. Solve x cubed plus 2x plus 1 equals 0. With any luck, with any luck, it doesn't work with the internet. Let me try once again. Solve x cubed plus 2x plus 1 equals 0. We'll give it one more go. It's not, it's not happy with me. Let me try a different one. Prime factors of 2,429,329. That was a random number in my head. OK, well, we got some kind of answer there. So what I was trying to show you uh, was that this has found the prime factors of that number. I've spoken to my phone, and it's gone away and calculated the prime factors of a number. You know, when you get things so easy to use, particularly if the internet is, uh, is uh, playing, playing for you, 
you really have to ask the question as to why we're trying to teach people to do that by hand when it's so immediate, so easy, so, so direct. I wanted to summarize not only the computer-based maths, but some of the other effects of technology, some of which we heard about here. There's changing the subject of math. There's the individualized learning, which was touched on, which I think is crucial. There's the online learning, MOOC, so-called. There's also the ability to use real data, actually pull in real examples from the world. You know, don't do statistics with five data points. Do it with 10,000 real data points that came in yesterday from the financial markets. That's the kind of thing we can do with a modern computing environment and the interactive scientific materials I showed you. Well, let me draw to a conclusion. One of the bigger things than just mathematics that I think we have to address in education is the role of mechanization in the real world and automation. As the world gets more automated, the question is, what is our reaction to that in education? One reaction we can have is to decide we're going to continue to teach people how to get around the machines, how to do the same as they always did in history, just, just somehow do it as well and then uh, use the machines when they, when they get out of education. I think that's the wrong approach and it will not stand the test of time and I don't think it has in past, past uh, epochs. So the, the other choice is to stand on the power of automation, to decide we use the best real world tools we accept them, they're there, and we, and we stand on them and move further and go further. In the last few decades has been the turn of STEM and particular maths that drive STEM to get that automation. Computers are the most amazing transformation of any ancient subject that I can think of in changing the basis of that subject, in automating it, in mechanizing it. We should stand on that power. And I have to say, I believe computer-based maths in one form or other is inevitable. If you look 25 years down the road, one of two things will have happened to mathematics. It will either have turned into ancient Greek, become a highly specialized subject that is great. If people wish to do that because they're interested in it, that's fantastic. It's not the thing we should be forcing the entire world to do. Or it will turn into a mimic of the real subject, the real world maths, which is based on computers. The big question is where first? Which country or countries will first leapfrog the other countries in being able to apply this and move their STEM education far, far further forward than the others have managed? Well, I hope you'll join uh, in uh, transforming mathematics around the world. And as we do so, I hope we can have fun for everyone involved, in particular the students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Conrad, very, very much. And uh, that was a, a very provocative uh, Offering. I have two very, very quick points um, which I wanted to put to you. One is, as you perhaps accidentally but deftly demonstrated, the computer is not yet an organic extension of ourselves. And therefore, suddenly we are not completely self-reliant. We are reliant on something which might, might break. Uh, you, so that, that's one point. But the other thing is, surely um, in learning how to calculate, I learned about logic. And in learning about logic, I learned about life. And, and, and that's surely a fundamental element of our education. Uh, we need you by the microphone. Right. Let me take the second, uh, the second one first. Um, I think there are a whole variety of ways to learn logic. One of them, I think, is very powerful, is programming. And I think it's a mistake to learn logic with hand calculating, which is fairly useless for most people, and they're not really learning the logic in many cases. They're learning a process that they probably don't understand. But isn't it beautiful? One plus one equals two. Yes. That's a terribly important fact. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, but it takes us to so many other facts. There are certain bases. I think the... So uh, let me change the question a little bit into... No, what I asked the, the question. You okay. can't change it. <laughs> OK, I won't change it. Huh. No, I mean, there are certain things you need to learn by hand, basic things about arithmetic, both because they're useful practically. I estimate things in my head very often. I multiply things together. So I think times tables are somewhat useful. The other thing I think is useful is some conceptual understanding from that hand basis. But you've got to be really careful about that. People claim long division has some empowerment for them. I don't know why people claim this. Long division is something that, uh, you know, is a process that people learn, people don't really understand, I've never used, 
And yet somehow people claim empowerment from that, which I don't see. Much better to program a computer to do something. You can really understand the logic. You've got to get your logic straight to make a program. So I answered mine and your question, I think, hopefully. Now. The second question was about the fallibility of computers. You know, the reality is, many of the things like I wanted to do of solving a cubic equation, I couldn't do by hand myself very easily at all. So the computer is an extension in that sense of what I, what, was, what I was able to do. And the idea that we're by hand solving quadratic equations anyway seems quite false to me. Finally, give us the country you think is going to make it first. I don't know the country. I think we've got great interest from Eastern Europe, from uh, some of the uh, sort of uh, Asian region, around Singapore, for example. I won't mention Singapore specifically. And I hope some from this region. Thank you thank very you. much, Lee. Conrad Wolfram, thank you very much indeed.